Any of you ever heard of the comedian Yakov Smirnov? Mm -hmm. No, he's not named after the vodka. Well, when he first immigrated to the United States in the late 1970s, he spoke about how unprepared he was for what he would find when he went into a grocery store. He was amazed at the variety of instant products. He said, on my first shopping trip, I saw powdered milk. You just add water and poof, you've got milk. Powdered eggs. You just add water and you've got eggs. Powdered orange juice. You just add water and you've got orange juice. Powdered potatoes. And you just add water and you've got potatoes. And then I saw baby powder and I thought, wow, what a country this is. <laughs> he's joking. <laughs> but we, we tend to make assumptions, don't we? And we make assumptions about the Christian life, about Christian transformation, that some parts of the Christian church in the world believe that at the moment of salvation, your life is so utterly transformed by the grace of God that you will never sin ever again. That your life is now perfect and complete, and that you will always walk well with Christ. Does that speak of any of us? It certainly doesn't speak of my life. Some traditions in the Christian church call the time when we say yes to Jesus a moment of salvation that then is we experience the beginning of the change, of transformation, of becoming more and more like Jesus, one step at a time, one day at a time. Whatever you call it, some Christians look at it a little differently than others. Well, the Reformed tradition of which we has a I think a good understanding of the reality that we face. We are at one and the same time in Christ and yet also we are prone to sin. And the purpose of our Christian life journey walking with Christ is to be less and less prone to sin as we walk with Him and more and more prone to worshiping God with every aspect of our lives. But for those who think that the moment of salvation you're made perfect, pure, holy, a hundred years ago they used to be called the holy rollers, then that is sort of like going to the Christian grocery store and there on the shelf you find powdered Christians and poof, all you do is add water and you've got an instant perfect. Christian. There's no such power. I'm sorry to say, there's no such power. Disciples of Jesus are never instant. All we have to do is read the Gospels and look at the lives of the disciples. And even after the day of Pentecost, when we think they were the most perfect example of Christians ever, it didn't take them long, a matter of a couple of weeks. If you read through the book of Acts as well, before you discover the fighting and the squabbling and the disagreements amongst those first Christians and the splits that ended up happening in the early Christian church. Christian disciples, followers of Jesus, those who are devoted to following Jesus with their daily lives are growing. We're not instantly made. And we grow, we're raised up through trials suffering, temptations. It's a slow <coughs> process. Do you know why I love cleaning? <coughs> you saying, I didn't know you cleaned one come to my house. <laughs> I love cleaning because it's instant results. Oh my goodness. It's 
wonderful because the rest of life there's not very many instant results. I didn't get to look this handsome overnight. Enough. It takes a year. It takes a lot of work. Okay, am I turning red now? <laughs> Sorry, I mean that wasn't in there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> a study has found that only about 10% of church-going teenagers have a healthier sense and understanding and reality of faith in their lives. And that that percentage actually grows into adulthood to about 30% of Christians who attend church have a healthy sense of what it means to be a Christ follower. Why is it so low? No. Well, because true life change begins at salvation and takes a lifetime. And I would like to see all of you who think you are patient people, please raise your hands. Wow. Oh, you guys are... Oh, Angela, I'm sorry. You raised your hand? Okay, good. There's one of us. Thank you. I'll talk to you later, Rob. We're not very patient for many things in our lives every day, let alone being patient for how God and His Spirit works in our lives to grow us up. Or as the Apostle Paul would use the language, to mature us in Christ. It takes... A lifetime. It takes training. It takes trials. It takes temptations. It takes falling flat on our faces. It takes scrambling to get up. It takes suffering and even dying before we realize this is how God works to grow us mature in Christ. There's a wondrous encounter between a Jewish dad and his son. <clears throat> when the son came home from school, instead of asking his son if he got all the questions right at school, he said to him instead, son, did you ask all the right questions? That father believed that asking the proper questions is just as important as being able to almost boastfully say, I got all the right answers. Ever since an experience that I had when I was in engineering school at Western University, did I ever tell you about it? Mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Lyon, electricity and magnetism class, hated it. <clears throat> That's why I'm not an engineer. One of the reasons why I'm not an engineer. And at the end of the lecture, three hour lecture on electricity, he said, are there any questions? And hands went up everywhere. We had no clue what he was talking about. Hands went up. And finally, it was my turn. And he got to me and said, yes. And I asked my question. And he looked at me and started to laugh and said, that was the stupidest question ever. Next. Ever since then, I've always tried to encourage people to ask their questions. Because there's no such thing as a stupid question. Asking questions help us to learn and help us to understand and to grasp something. Every good teacher knows the power of asking questions, especially the right questions. And Jesus was a great teacher. He was the best teacher, we believe, who ever lived. And as such, he asked a lot of questions. Questions like, if you're only friendly to the people that are your friends that are just like you, how are you any different from anybody else? Can any of you add an hour's length to your life by worrying? Who your worries? <laughs> if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a hole in the ground on the Sabbath day and the Sabbath says, the Sabbath laws say you're not supposed to do any work, which of you wouldn't go and rescue that sheep out of the pit? Questions like, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Jesus asked hundreds of questions. 
That's what you do when you want people to start thinking and to think for themselves and try to come to some solid conclusions. The most important question, though, that Jesus ever asked was found in the passage you read from Mark's Gospel this morning. He and his disciples were in the region of Caesarea Philippi when he asked his disciples, So, you listen to all the chatter. You're up on all the social media. What's the word out there about me? Who do people say I am? And they said, well, you know, some of them think you're John the Baptist. Some of them think that you're Elijah. Some of them think you're one of the Old Test other Old Testament prophets. You know, just they think you're somebody good, somebody big. So important. And then Jesus turned the question around onto them. Okay, but who do you say that I am? Who do you think I really am? You see what he's doing? He wants his disciples to be able to verbalize what they believe and are starting to understand in their own hearts, in the core of their very being. Who is this guy? We've devoted our lives now to him. We're following him around. Who is he anyway? And Peter, always never the spokesperson for the group of the disciples, said quickly from the head, You're the Messiah. Probably simply putting into words what the rest of the disciples had been thinking and, and maybe even whispering about. This is the one that we've been waiting for for centuries. This is the one who was promised to us. This is the one who's going to deliver us. Israel, you are the Messiah, Peter said. And then, as Jesus often did, but no more importantly than this time, he cautioned his disciples, he warned them, don't tell. Don't tell anyone. On the one hand, when you say that to somebody in your life, you tell them not to tell. What's the one of the first things? Especially little kids. What do they do? They go and tell everybody. But I think in this case, Jesus didn't really want them to tell anybody. At least not yet. And there's a very specific reason for that. And then Jesus began to tell them that he's going to suffer. At the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of God's law, that he would be rejected by them and by his own people. That he would suffer and die. And three days later that he would rise again. He spoke clearly about this to his followers. So that none of them could misunderstand what he was saying. And when he was finished, Simon Peter, who just declared, you're the Messiah, takes Jesus aside. Come on, over here, over here, quickly. And offers him some advice. Is that what it said? The scripture said that Peter rebuked Jesus. Can you imagine? You just confessed, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And then you take him aside and you rebuke him. You are ultra critical and scolding of him for what he's just said. He's the Messiah. You don't take the Messiah aside and rebuke him. Speak caustically to him about what he's just said. Wow. Peter got the answer right. You are the Messiah. But he drew the wrong conclusion. Absolutely right. Jesus is the Savior of the world. But absolutely wrong as to what that meant. His conclusion. Peter was a product of his culture. He expected the same kind of Messiah, the same kind of Savior that everyone else expected. That's why Jesus so sternly told them, don't tell anybody of his identity. If they weren't ready, because they didn't really understand what that meant, Jesus is the Messiah, how much confusion would they spread by telling people that he's the Messiah? People had many misunderstandings of what the Messiah was to be. The promised Davidic Messiah was commonly thought to be a political, nationalistic leader. One who would bring the government to be the greatest government in the world. 
They figured that he would be somebody who would lead Israel to become free from Roman domination. But Jesus' mission was not at all like that. He was not there simply to deliver Israel. He was there to deliver the world from the power of sin and death. It couldn't be achieved through a simple revolt. Others thought that the Savior was going to be not only a political leader, but a great military leader who would lead a revolt against Rome and reestablish Israel's greatness as in the glory golden days under King David. If only, if only we could go back to the good old days. The disciples, including Peter, didn't have a clue what it all meant that Jesus is the Messiah. Contrary to popular messianic expectations of his day, Jesus did not come to establish an earthly kingdom. He came to establish God's kingdom here on earth and to utterly transform God's creation one bit at a time, one person at a time. Jesus declared that the Son of Man, He, the Messiah, would suffer many things, be rejected and killed, and after three days, rise again from the dead. For the disciples who were listening to Jesus, this was a completely new paradigm, massive shift that they just didn't get. This is God's plan for his creation. His suffering and his death must happen. And in contrast to previously veiled language, Jesus spoke plainly about the need for his death and resurrection. Peter heard, he got the words, and even though he just confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, he could not reconcile what Jesus just said, Messiah is, with his own understanding, his own expectations of Messiahs. And therefore, he jumped to the wrong conclusion, and he rebuked Jesus. I wonder how often we do that. Oh, I'm sure actually there are times when we would like to rebuke Jesus. When we tell God he doesn't know what he's doing. That's a form of a rebuke to God. But there's also times when we get the questions right, but we draw the wrong conclusion. And that's revealed by how we live or how we don't live for God. <clears throat> if I were to ask you to come to the front one by one, starting with Rebecca, the microphone's here is on. Right, Lori? Yep. Right. And if you were to come to the front one by one and tell everybody who loves you more than anyone in all the world could ever love you, more than even your mom loves you, even more than your dad loves you, even more than your spouse loves you, more than everybody combined, who loves you that much? The answer is Jesus. God. Made real through his son Jesus Christ and powerfully revealed as truth to us by the gift of his Holy Spirit. I have no doubt that every one of you here would answer that sort of way. You get the answer right. But would we draw the correct conclusion or conclusions? If God loves us so much, does that mean that God's going to put an invisible shield around us? and around me, that nothing bad will ever happen to us because he loves us. Intellectually, we say, of course not. That's not true. But in day-to-day -day living, how many of us have ever experienced an intense time of suffering? A phenomenal time of grief where we just didn't know if we were going to be able to get through it. We couldn't see any way out. And we asked the question then, why? And why me? Many others do too. And the best thing 
to do, I believe, to conquer our grief in those situations is to embrace it, to cry, 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 and talk it out with God and with the people closest to us to talk it out and cry and to remember <coughs> that in the midst of those times, God is just as close to us as our very breathing. Face our grief head on. Some of you, some of us, have encountered such situations of intense suffering and grief. Facing it head on can be a challenge. And how does it affect our faith? How does it affect our understanding of God? I've seen it happen too many times that for some people, it drives them away from God. Because they drew the conclusion that, why has this happened to me? I'm a beloved child of God. Doesn't that mean that nothing so, so bad should be happening to me? I've seen it over and over. But when you're able to hold on to your knowledge of God's love for you, and sometimes at those times it is only knowledge, because the heart is so broken that we have to trust that our knowledge of God is real and is accurate. That God's love is for us, even in the midst of the most painful tragedies. That's harder to do, isn't it? You see, we know God loves us more than anyone else ever could in all of the world. But that doesn't mean what we sometimes expect it to mean. That he will protect us with an invisible shield from all things that would hurt us. Peter, who just proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, immediately rebukes Jesus when he announced that he must suffer and die. And then Jesus tells the disciples and the crowd that if they want to live, to truly live, then they must take up their cross and follow him. Now, now hold on. We say, hold on a second here, Jesus. It's one thing to hear you talking about you having to suffer and die. Okay, maybe I can deal with that. But I didn't sign up for me having to carry a cross either. That's a little bit much, don't you think? His cross sounds bad enough. But us too? We too have to carry a cross? Peter gave the right answer, but the wrong conclusion. We do it too. And yet, even when we do it, Jesus is still the Savior, the Messiah. He is still the Son of God. And He still loves us more than anybody else in all the world could ever possibly love us combined. Jesus is still Lord. So therefore, what can we do? Trust Him. Trust Him. If you go through a time of trial, trust Him. If you go through a time of suffering, trust Him. If we go through unbelievable temptations and fall on our faces, trust Him. If we go through intense grief, trust Him. If we stand at the door of death where someone we know and love is there, the best thing to do is trust Him. For He is always the Savior, our Savior, the Lord of life. And what that means, fully means, will be one day revealed to us when we see him face to face. For as the scripture says, until that time, we see through a glass darkly. But every step of the way, we walk by. What's another word for trust? Faith. We walk by faith. You know, it's bad enough when you have somebody in a group and everybody's lined up and you say, okay, I want you to fall back and trust the persons behind you are going to catch you. 
I could not do this. This is intense trust. That's what it takes every day. Trust in God. And He will always see us through, no matter what.